afternoon. Um, intrepid guest, <laughs> it's, uh, it's great of you to travel out uh, on, a, on a snow day. Actually, it was pretty easy getting around after I got done shoveling the driveway, but which took an hour. The, um, my name is Rich Terrapack, and I'm chair of the board, as Shane had told you, for the Metropolitan Club. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so yet, but we encourage you to tweet, always responsibly. Uh, you, you, can you can follow our hashtag, by the way, is a CMC forum, and you can follow, follow us at CMC at CBUS Metro Club. Uh, and all that information is in your uh, forum flyer today. I want to talk a little bit about upcoming events, particularly next week. Um, the, uh, next week we've got Jungle Jack coming, and uh, the new CEO of the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, Tom Stahl, uh, and moderated by Jeff Hogan from WBNS-TV. Uh, the forum is sponsored by U.S. Bank with support from the dispatch. Don't be surprised if you see some uh, other uh, maybe four-legged creatures around here someplace uh, <laughs> beforehand. It'll be kind of fun. It's always a zoo here at the Athletic Club. Um, <laughs> you'll find this and other upcoming events uh, on our new app, which, by the way, is free for downloading, of course, and visit us our w at our website, columbusmetroclub.org. Um, membership. As Shane indicated, we're, we are approaching, uh, we're, we're currently at our largest membership ever in the, in the club's history. We're approaching 1,000 members, and we'd love to have any of you who um, are here as a guest and have attended previously to, to sign up. Uh, there are some benefits, uh, re reduced prices on, on lunch, uh, other tangible benefits, but also a lot of networking friendships that, that we all enjoy week to week. Uh, in the forum flyer is a list of everyone who is attending today, and you'll see a, a guest list and a member list. We want you to move from one to the other if you're a guest. So uh, just check with the, with the staff or um, go online. It's, it's really easy to join. I'm pleased to introduce a new member if uh, she is here. Uh, please stand if you're around so we can recognize you, Renee Hawkins of AEP. Okay. <laughs> At least she's not restoring power to those thousand people. Uh, yeah. so I'd also like to recognize our sponsors. Uh, there are nearly 80 companies and organizations who help sustain the Metropolitan Club and our mission of community conversation. Uh, the benefits of sponsorship are many, and there's always room for more. If any of your organizations are interested, uh, please, let, please let us know. Uh, it's, a, it's truly rewarding. I think we found that all 80 of the sponsors uh, last year uh, really enjoyed the benefits. Uh, today's forum is sponsored by Ice Miller, represented by Steve Smith and his associates, and WCBE 90.5 FM, represented by Dan Masako, right over here. Um, please thank them for their support. <laughs> There's a biography of each speaker in your forum flyer today, so I'll provide just brief introductions. Our first speaker is an inventor and designer of products, systems, and technologies, and holds over 75 five worldwide patents. He is CEO and founder of Univenture and Algae Venture Systems, Inc. Please welcome Ross Young. <laughs> Our next speaker has spent nearly 30 years in healthcare-related industries, including Arthur Anderson and Cardinal Health. Last fall, he became president and CEO of, of by Sora Pharmaceuticals. Please welcome Kurt Beek. <laughs> and moderating the panel is uh, the general manager of CD 90.5 FM and host of the Amazing Science Emporium, which is amazing that he gets it done every day, Dan Malsecco. <laughs> On behalf of Ice Miller, WCBE, the Columbus Metropolitan Club, we welcome all of our panelists here today. And Dan, the microphone is yours. I'm not really sure where to start with this topic. I mean, yeah, look at you, look at us. We braved Columbus's what's turned out to be the biggest snowstorm of the year to come here today and talk about algae. Algae, the bane of every aquarium owner's existence. And here we are. What could possibly motivate us to sit here and learn about this thing that only makes headlines when it blooms and keeps swimmers away from ocean vacation resorts. 
I mean, you know, seriously, never mind Jaws. Oh, there's algae out there or something. Algae. Scientifically, it's defined as a varied group of six phyla of primitive eukaryotic chlorophyll-containing organisms, ranging in size from the microscopic single-celled forms to the multicellular seaweeds 30 meters or more in length, characterized by an absence of true roots, leaves, and stem. I'm stimulated. <laughs> now, to the layperson, that should read algae. It's slimy. It's stinky. It's just plain gross. And it just might save your life. Primitive cultures long ago learned that certain plants and fungi can treat disease such as willow bark, which contains the natural precursor to aspirin. Science began isolating these natural pharmaceuticals over a century ago. Penicillin is a great example. It was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming when he accidentally went on vacation, leaving a huge pile of dirty Petri dishes left to be washed. And when he came back, lo and behold, the mold that was growing there was preventing bacteria from growing. Incidentally, I've tried this as an excuse with my wife not to do the dishes at night, and it doesn't fly. <laughs> From bark and dirty dishes, we move to the sea. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the folks who brought you today's fine weather forecast, their technology partnerships office states that, and I've got to get this right, success will result in the commercial development of new and unique chemical compounds from the sea which have benefits to human health, either through disease prevention or new treatment for disease. In other words, it's a new pharmacy factory. And that is the algae we're here to talk about today. So, clear the water, so to speak. <laughs> um, Ross, Kurt, I want you to introduce yourselves with these questions. First, Ross, well, who are you? <laughs> and what led you to create your company in the first place, and then Kurt, who are you, and what motivated you to join Ross in this great pursuit? So Ross, go ahead and start. Well, terrific, I appreciate that, and I would like to uh, thank the Columbus Metropolitan Club also for uh, having us uh, present today. Uh, but what I will say is I've been on quite a path over the last 25 years, and it certainly started with plastics, and though it may seem a little bit disfocused, it, it lines up pretty well with where we started and where we're at today. We're still involved in plastics at a company called Univenture, uh, which I did find, found in uh, 1988, originally to make packaging for compact disc. Ultimately, we got involved in other plastic products, then we got involved in bio-based products. And it was that involvement in bio-based products that really brought on the question, if you're going to make a lot of products in this world out of bio-based materials, where are you going to get all the biomass that isn't competing with food? And that is essentially where we started our research into algae. And what attracted me to algae originally was the fact that it was this area that was really unexplored. Uh, technically, I think there's a book out there where they call it Blue Ocean Strategy. When you're talking about a field that had very little investment, but massive opportunity. And what we determined pretty rapidly is the massive opportunity was directly related to the fact that you get so much more productivity out of algae than virtually any terrestrial-based plant. So it can produce that biomass. And when we started to look at that amount of biomass that you can create, we really recognized that it wasn't just a product. It was virtually every product that you could see from the terrestrial agriculture. So everything from energy to materials to plastics to foods to feeds to fertilizers, nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals. So it is this new opportunity and this new revolution and as we started that research, we ended up with creating some technologies. And it's those technologies that bring us today to talk about drug discovery. Great, thanks, Ross. <laughs> now, did everybody understand that? There'll be a quiz later. <coughs> um, so why, why did I uh, 
join Ross and the team is that uh, I uh, retired from Cardinal in uh, October of 2011. I had two great careers, one at Arthur Anderson and then at Cardinal Health. And I was really looking for uh, to stay in the healthcare area, but to do one more big thing that was actually closer to chronic disease than where I had played in the past. And so how I looked at it was relatively straightforward. I said, okay, is it a big industry? 500 plus billion dollars in pharmaceutical industry. Is there a willingness to pay for results? Spend 100 billion dollars a year in R&D. Is there a problem to solve? Driest pipeline in 10 years and no blockbusters in the last five. And you have products like Lipitor, an 18 billion dollar product that went off patent uh, in 2011. And is there uniqueness in how to actually attack the issue? And with Ross's technology, it absolutely has all of those factors. But also, probably more for me, you know, having a brother-in-law that uh, died of leukemia, my mom passed a year ago with Alzheimer's, wouldn't it be great if 15 years from now, as products that we identify get developed by Pfizer and BMS and GSK and Lilly uh, actually can make a difference. And so that's uh, also, from a personal perspective, some of the key reasons why I joined. That's actually, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the reason I do is that you know, with my work, part of my whole point is to point out how science is really about people. It's not about the numbers, it's not about the theories, it's people. And you just gave a great example of what is ultimately motivating you to work on this side. Ross, do you have a similar, what's, what's the people side of you being involved in this? Y you know I do. Uh, part of it is that I believe that the development of sustainable technologies, sustainable products, can be leveraged by the development of high value products. So it always starts, any technology, any development, you want to start with the highest value possible to pay for its advancement. You don't start at the lowest value, you start where there's the most opportunity. And with this, this becomes a natural evolution of development. Could it lead to great pharmaceutical products? Absolutely. Could it lead to other products that are of a lower value into the future? that can have an impact on civilization? And the answer to that is absolutely. These are technologies that will develop over time and they will have an impact that ultimately will be profound on this planet. You may see, and I would love to say we're going to see it, but at least we will have ancestors that see it. You may see clear water again running through Columbus because of technologies that ultimately evolve from where we're at today and allow that to occur. And, and, and those are sustainable technologies directly related to cleaning up waste, whether they're atmospheric waste or they're pollution uh, and other waste from ever reaching the water in the first place. So you've got to start somewhere and there's no doubt that we're starting with our technology suite in an area that has the highest value. Cool, that's huge big picture. So let's go all the way to the opposite extreme on what is going to make that happen. And that's microalgae. So on the geek side of things, so we know <laughs> how the world is gonna change, what is a microalgae consortia? Well, terrific, I'll, I'll jump right into that. And, and that is essentially when you go to any water that is around <laughs> this environment, you will find potentially more than 5,000 species in essentially a liter of water. Now that may seem a little bit scary, but if we went down to the river or we went to the closest pond, you would find 5,000 microorganisms or more in a liter of water. And that's not, that's individual species, okay? Now the reality of that is you're talking about less than a gram of biomass. And you're talking about science can't even tell you every organism that's in there because science itself can only culture 1% of those organisms in that liter of water. That leaves 99% of those organisms that have never been studied potentially for drugs. And it's the technologies that we created that was 
funded by the Department of Energy that allows us to take enough of that microorganism consortia, which includes bacteria, it includes viruses, it, it, it includes molds and fungus, and of course algae, which is the primary producer. And we can grab all of that and study all of that. And then the one other very amazing thing about being able to study that entire consortia of organisms is you have the capability to see activities because of the competitive pressures. So you're not growing it in a petri dish as a single organism, it is growing in the natural environment and competing. And it's those activities that produce the chemicals that give organisms an advantage and thus can lead to drugs. Well, and that brings up now Kurt's involvement because you mentioned new technologies to be able to start studying these microorganisms. And Kurt, you had mentioned that that's part of why you got involved because he's got something different going on here. So between the two of you, what, what are you doing differently? What is the technology that you're able to do these assays? Yeah, it's a couple of things. Um, first of all, it's that inside of that consortia, it's what's called secondary metabolites. Don't want to get into a lot of science with you, but the secondary metabolites that are created that no one has ever been able to look before, look at before why, and certainly not for drug discovery. Why not? Because you couldn't get enough of it. And so if you think about it, if you go and garner 10 or 20 pounds of dry weight biomass, and by the time you do what's called fractioning to get it to actually study, you know, you're talking about this much. And you won't be able to do any level of pharmaceutical studies with that amount of biomass. Our technology allows you to get over a ton of it dry weight. So now for the first time, science can actually look at the material and have enough of it to actually do, actually do testing. Um, you know, examples would be is we have 13 of our compounds that we've identified. Um, we put into uh, Eli Lilly what they call their open innovation program. And we were hoping that of those 13, since this is our first shot at it, maybe one or two they'd want to look at. Well, they told us at the end of December they want to look at all 13. So we know that what we're doing and what we're finding is of interest to pharma. There is no question about that. And we have people like uh, Dr. Peter Moeller, who's at NOAA, who participates and oversees our science lab down there. And when he first saw the biomass, and he's been studying this type of thing for 30 years, he goes, I have never seen so much bioactive activity in my 30-year career. You guys got something special here. Now, without you know, breaking patent or proprietary secrets, can, can you give a general uh, description of what it is that's different? How are you generating that much biomass? Because you know, from that much to a ton? I'll answer that, the okay. one that holds the patent, because okay. I don't hold any of them, just to be clear. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually pretty interesting, even to me, because what we ended up discovering is that you can use nature in the way nature has designed movements of water through systems, and you can do so very efficiently and separate out very small solids. And when you think about these organisms in the water, you're talking about things that are under 10 microns. Uh, you're, you're thousands and thousands of inches in size. You're so small, it goes through normal filtration. Well, what we recognized and realized that water has properties, and you can move water because of the adhesion of water and then you can separate solids. And it was that technology, our approach at looking at something counterintuitively, that we came up with patentable technologies that ultimately the DOE helped fund. Now the original goal was to get it to where we could move 10 tons potentially in a hour. The reality of it is, is we can move kilogram quantities in an hour. Not enough for things like plastics or or, or, or uh, something like uh, biofuels, but easily enough for the drug discovery that Kurt's talking about. And that technology itself is something that uh, we are continuing to pursue and continuing to advance, but it's already at the scale and capability to already do what our major focus is. We don't have to invent anything. All we have to do is execute. 
I have mentioned several times, both of you actually, that you know, Big Pharma is watching. Why? What, what is the reason they see so much potential in the biomass? Why, why do they think this is the way to go instead of going to the lab and synthesizing, coming up with entirely new chemicals? Well, let me, let me grab that one. Um, probably about 10 years ago, most of Big Pharma actually disbanded a lot of their natural product labs um, and thinking that the way of the future was to take this and this and combine it together and somehow it's going to kill the next cancer cell that's sitting in the Petri dish. Well, history has shown that hasn't worked. And so, you know, now they're looking for companies like ours to partner with to do to that can bring unique compounds to them, which by the way, we pre-screen every one of our compounds that's in our library against multiple cancer assays. So we already know before we even bring them to a pharma player that uh, it already has been active against multiple types of cancer and antibiotics and anti-inflammatory type of assays. And so, you know, we already know that's going to be of interest. But again, it goes back to what I said before. This has been the driest ever pipeline in history of pharmaceuticals. When you have somebody like Pfizer that loses $18 billion off of their top line from a drug going generic, very difficult to replace that. And what they're seeing is, is that a lot of pharma companies to combat that were buying uh, products that compounds that were in phase two and phase three of clinical trials and then half of those never made it through the process and they weren't focusing on drug discovery the front end of the process which is where we play and so they're all now realizing the mistakes and needing to reinvest and looking for companies that have things unique and we're looking at a place where no one's been able to look before we're not looking at tree bark we aren't looking at plants. We're looking at a, an area where it has to naturally, similar to human cells, has to naturally fight itself, uh, in a, well, its competitors, to stay alive. And so there's that natural activity that's going on versus if I'm pulling beetle juice out of a beetle that actually, believe it or not, is used for warts, um, it's not having to fight anything. And so that's that new science that's being created. Well, you, know, you, you mentioned cancer, anti-inflammatories. More specifically, what, what are you seeing hints of as you're doing these assays? Well, what, what are you seeing hints of that you're going to be able to, I don't know, cure, treat? Yeah, yeah. No, um, you know, we've sent um, 15 compounds into NCI, National Cancer Institute. And again, hoping that maybe 10 or 20 percent they'd want to look at. Well, to date, more than 85% of all the compounds that we've sent in, they're interested in looking at. And they have 60 screens, 60 cancer assays across nine different types of cancer that they're testing for. Now, we haven't made, we, we haven't had one make it all the way through yet, um, and they're looking for higher potency. They like the toxicity, because the main reason why, if, if you have loved ones, I'm sure, in this room that have had cancer, is that the reason why it has to be administered in a physician's office is because of the toxicity level. Well, algae in that consortium naturally have toxicities to it. That's why, again, Peter Moeller out of NOAA, that's his specialty, is toxins. And so between having um, Dr. Guy Carter, who's our chief science officer, who's retired head of natural products out of Wyeth before they were acquired by Pfizer, teamed with the best guy on toxins, I, have, I couldn't ask for a better team. And so I have two of the best guys that are going to be able to identify those types of compounds that are most um, potent and toxic for that type of research. I'm going to jump in here and just say, too, that when you talk about the range of therapeutic areas that we can focus, when you look at a microorganisms consortia, all the activity for survival, all the activity that's needed to compete is actually within a lot of disease states. So virtually the disease you can think of, we very well may have a potential cure already within our grasp. And that is really important, and that's one of the reasons that we've started to really reach out and collaborate with a number of players in the industry. And just recently, uh, we collaborated with Ohio State and Dr. Kinghorn specifically on anti-cancer compounds for colon cancer. 
And that's something that has just started, but we're already happy with what we're seeing. Can I, can I tell on that just for a second? Yeah. <coughs> and one other thing to be thinking about as you think about this space is that if I'm a pharma manufacturer, historically, I know the types of disease states I want to focus on, whether it's cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, whatever it may be. And so we will really be a utility to the pharma industry because our compounds will likely be effective against multiple disease states. And so, you know, we won't be partnering with just one of the pharma players. We will be partnering with multiple players because our compounds can be active against multiple disease states. Yeah. And, and that's not meaning that a single compound will hit these different diseases. It means we've got such a rich source, it leads to that factory that we talk about, that we've got a drug discovery factory, and we're going to have compound after compound that does those. So it's not too much of a stretch, although it is speculation, to say that conceivably microconsortia could be the panacea for all ills. You know, finally, the patent medicine operative has come, and it's a good for what ails you. I think that would be a vision that we would love to be able to grab. I think we've got some very good scientific minds that keep us well grounded mm -hmm. in the reality, very focused. And I think that we're going to learn more virtually day after day. Uh, do we have hope and promise? Absolutely. But you really have to achieve in order to achieve. Well, let's get back to the gun, to the practical side. On, on the consumer side of things, there's no secret that a lot of drugs, despite some of the programs that Meyer and Giant Eagle and stuff have for freebies, but that a lot of drugs are really incredibly expensive. For the consumer, could this be an answer to that? Could this help bring down the cost of drugs, both in expenses on research and expenses of manufacturing? Let, let me hit, hit on that one. Is that <clears throat> today it costs over $2 billion to bring a product, a, a single compound, all the way through the new drug approval process. And that's targeted, estimated to be three and a half billion dollars by 2015. If you, this here, this chart here that's in your materials, that shows you the di difference between drug discovery and drug development. And in there it talks about the dollars associated with that nearly two billion dollars I mentioned. What we will be able to do at the front end that isn't even on that chart is roughly two to two and a half years of target identification that gets done inside of each one of the pharma players. Because again, they're trying to do mixtures of things to test what they're interested in. So we believe with our technology that we will literally be shortening the time frame of that discovery process from five and a half years or seven and a half years on average to roughly four. And so that will, on each drug itself, that will pull somewhere between $250 million to $350 million out of the cost. Now, the real question is, will, will that drug company pass that through to the benefit of the patient, or will they pass it through to the benefit of their shareholder? That's the question we do not know the answer to. Well, let's get that to your side. <laughs> Obviously, you will need investors or have had investors to help launch things. What, what do your investors say when they look at what kind of, what's a typical conversation with an investor? You've got a new technology, mm -hmm. so it's not like you can go through the standard market and just, just look at the price to earnings ratio sure. or something like that. What do you tell investors? What, what is attractive to someone to invest in this? A and it really is some of the comments I mentioned earlier. Is it a big market? Yes, $500 billion. Is, is it somebody that's willing to pay? The average license, and again, there's, I think there's, yeah, here, but the big ones back there, but on average, what, when pharma goes to license a compound, they, if one makes it all the way through, which again, only one in five, only 5% 5 do. So of the 20, as hypothetically, of the 20 that start in, only one of those is gonna actually make it out the other end. But if it does, as the licensor, you get a little over $400 million of earnings without really doing that. Um, and because you, you're the one that created it, you own the IP, and once you license it, you don't have any further obligations. But also, if you then do the waterfall, 
and say, of those 20, three of them are going to die at the lead stage. Three more won't make it past optimized leads, preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three. If you do all that math, on average, each compound is worth um, roughly $20 million. And so, you know, there's huge economics in here. Why? Because you're solving very big problems. And so it really comes down to big market, willingness to pay, and an economic model that is very efficient on our behalf, and we're rewarded accordingly. One, one of the things I'm going to jump in there, too, okay. is when you look at uh, social investing, and there are a number of people that will actually have a strategy to socially invest, you may not know exactly where and how those funds get put to use. Um, the one thing about in, in choosing companies that are doing specific things, you certainly can keep your thumb on them in a way that you may not be able to do if you're, let's say, uh, investing in other ways. Um, it's, it's great to be able to connect uh, uh, a opportunity to serve mankind in some way, at the same as you invest your dollars. And, and I think all of us uh, philanth philanthropically do a number of those kinds of things. The real question is, can you also do it in a manner uh, where you can keep score? And this is a good manner to keep score when you look at the kind of things that companies like ours would be doing. Yeah, I had a, a, a gentleman mention to me just two days ago. He goes, I would rather invest in this business, not only because I'm going to get, get a great return on my money, mm -hmm. but because if I go and contribute a million dollars into cancer research of a nonprofit, one, I don't know if it's being used efficiently, and two, I get no re real reporting on how my money is actually making a difference. They will be, you know, our investors, we, we're looking for truly passionate investors that really have a reason to want to be part of our group. So in a way, even the investors are mission oriented. Um, I just wanted to pause really quick. We've only got time for a couple more questions because we're about five minutes away from the Q&A portion where you can ask some cool questions. So stand by and be ready for that. First, because time is limited to that, for those who want to learn more after the forum, what's the best way to find out more about what you're doing? Uh, you know, we have uh, a couple social media outlets out there. We have biosorcia.com. Uh, we can be contacted that way. We also have a Twitter account, so we post our news uh, as it occurs onto our Twitter account. And I will tell you that we're going to have probably three more announcements in the next three weeks. Uh, so we did just announce the Ohio State announcement last week, and uh, there was a little bit of a uh, press release on that. But we understand that engaging people to understand what we're doing is an important. So uh, we can be reached out to uh, and essentially we will communicate with you uh, directly as well. And my final question is, is more dreamy because it is the last one. I really want to, and I want both of your inputs on this because you come from different perspectives. Say it's three, five years from now and CMC asks us back to do this exact same panel. What is going to be different? What will have happened, without revealing the announcements coming in three days, what, what, is, what do you foresee is happening within the next few years in your field? What will we be talking about when we're sitting up here again? As it relates to Biosortia, we will, my view would be is that we will have uh, licensed probably 20 to 30 compounds and we will know exactly what disease states those are in, how many are impacting cancer, and hopefully by that time frame, actually many of them will be in the preclinical stages. And so we will be already getting a glimpse into the future around which disease and chronic diseases we're going to be able to impact. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. Ross? Um, I'm going to go a different tack from the drug discovery, but the reality of it is, is the company itself, uh, Algae Venture Biosortia, has its technology. And right now we have uh, two very large multi-billion dollar companies that are looking at our technology for all those applications south of pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, foods and feeds, things like that. 
So we have our technology and our equipment that's patented deployed in areas around the world right now. And I think what will happen is in that three or four year period, if one of those companies invests a appropriate amount of development to get it out of that valley of death, it may very well be starting to be used to pull biomass out of polluted lakes, to pull biomass out of growth systems and turning those into products. So visionary wise, we see a very valuable combination of what we've been able to achieve to date. Certainly three years from now, we'll be able to talk all about it. Fabulous. Thank you. And I gotta say, it's, for me, it's very refreshing to talk to two people who are mission oriented. It's, it's so rare, so many people focus on how much money you're gonna make, how much you know, notoriety you'll receive. But I love the fact that you've got a much bigger picture than just what's happening in the next quarter. So thanks, thank you. Thank you. Um, it is time for the Q&A section. Um, as promised, we'll take odd questions from the audience now. CMC does record the forum for statewide broadcast on the Ohio channel. So don't say anything you don't want your parents to hear. Forums are also available on YouTube through CMC's website. While you're at the microphone, please start by introducing yourself so we know who you are. And we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. So <laughs> let's take our first question. Thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> I've never seen this man before in my life. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Brickler and Eckler. I appreciate your sharing your vision of the future. I, I was curious, um, what do you see as your biggest obstacles to achieving the bright, beautiful future you envision? Um, it really comes down to throughput. I mean, it is, is as simple as that, is having the capabilities, the capital to actually end up doing multiple harvests a year um, so that we are literally generating a thousand compounds a year of which 200 of those would end up having uh, interest, pharmaceutical interest. And then typically about five to 10% of those would become licensable. And so it's all about throughput and we have the people, the technology and the capabilities to do that. And so that's why we're quite honestly, in a second rate. So as I understand what you're saying, the throughput obstacle is really a capital formation, mm -hmm. capital investment. Yep. No, I, I, as, a, as it relates to the ability to get, you know, literally tons of biomass, not an issue. The ability to identify different places to go harvest because we have such a great team in partnership with NOAA. They know all the, the right... Um, lakes and streams and parts of the ocean to participate in. And so, because every place we go, we will find different types of compounds. So, so in a perfect world, how would, you know, if you, if you, if you could write your own script, mm -hmm. how would you generate enough capital to generate the throughput to accomplish your mission? Well, the great thing is, is that it doesn't take that much capital. We have such a efficient process because of the technology is that you know, we don't need $20 million. We don't need $200 million to actually drive that uh, throughput. Thank you. I'm gonna add one more thing to that too, is, is when you look at the market itself, there is one mid-level, smaller pharmaceutical company that goes on seven seafaring voyages a year, spends about $200 million to go all areas of the globe to grab samples of microorganisms to see what they can grow. And again, they're only gonna grow 1% of what they actually come in contact with. So when you talk about efficiency, we can go down to the riverbank and find the kind of compounds that the medical industry and the uh, chemical industry, so agrochemical industry and also industrial chemical industry has never seen as compounds that have activity and potency. We are in a incredible advantage. That's why it doesn't take much capital. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Thompson and I'm an architect and being so I'm thinking like, what's this 
company look like? You know, I, I envision these these pond scum suckers that are out there, <laughs> you know, doing this sort of thing, and you've got a warehouse or something up in Dublin with, you know, big masses of crap. And <laughs> Those are actually the terms we use too. <laughs> <laughs> what does this thing look like? You know? Well, it looks two different ways, because when you talk about the technology side, that's one look. When you talk about the business side, that's another look. And what I'll give you a little picture of is the technological side. We can go anywhere on this globe efficiently and explore the microorganism consortia efficiently in a manner no one has ever been able to achieve. So in seven days of Grand Lake St. Mary recovery, we were able to get more than a ton of biomass. And this is microorganisms. This is the smallest kind of filter that you could come up with. It'll pass right through. So we're in a position where we're going after those single cells that are in this environment that nobody else has ever been able to pull together and do studies on. And if we got challenged to go do this 20,000 feet under the sea, we already have the technology to do it. It's a matter of setting it up and implementing it. So there is one warehouse in town that holds multiple skids of frozen, preserved biomass right now. And that biomass is what we send to be processed to reduce it through extractions and fractionization down to those compounds that have never been seen before. Hi, I'm Peter McCray. I have my own national architectural firm, McCray Architecture. Uh, Ross, you touched on my question. Are we going to be able to save Grand Lake St. Mary? You know, there's a combination of things to do that. We've looked at that and said it's an opportunity. Um, it, it produces about 500 tons of biomass a day. Um, so it has the capacity and the capability to be quite a little producer. Uh, <laughs> Now, put that in perspective, the western basin of Lake Erie, which has the same productive capability and as producing at that same rate, is more than 30 times the size of Grand Lake, and Grand Lake isn't that small. So the reality of it is, is a lot of our nutrients, whether they're coming straight from the air because of all the fossil fuels we're putting in there, are making the way to the waters. And it's algae that's cleaning it up. So we are at the beginning stages of coming up with the technologies that allow us to have clean water in the future. Hi, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, my name is Lauren Eider. I work with Battelle. I'm a chemist by training. I actually was involved in natural products drug discovery as an undergraduate, looking at going into that in graduate work, but as you referenced about 10 years ago, a lot of the natural products parts of companies started to um, be, be waned off, sort of looking more at structure activity relationships Drug companies thought there was a mathematical formula that we could calculate exactly what protein we want to target and, and make a molecule that looks just like that. As we know, it's not that simple. So natural products were, are inherently complex and inherently biologically suited. So that's why they're so attractive as drug, drug compounds. And I'm appreciative that you guys have uh, latched onto that as, as a business opportunity, sort of from the grassroots side. So my question to you guys is, algae is obviously not the only thing that you could pull natural products from. In this magnitude, think about kudzu. Uh, there's all sorts of other, uh, whether they're an eyesore or invasive species or things that are in, in large supply that we may or may not find the value in. Are there other things that you guys are looking at in the future? And is the, the technology that you've patented for algae transferable for, for that? I'll, I'll jump right into that. And, and the answer is it's always important for any business model to go in an area where you have got an advantage. And our advantage is, is we can get at biomass that nobody else on the planet can really get at. And it doesn't matter their technologies. They can try it with centrifuges. They can try it with cross-flow filtration. They can do it a dozen different ways. They're not going to come up with a consortia of microorganisms preserved the way we can. So our basic objective is, if it is a single cell or a very microscopic organism that nobody else can get to, that's our interest. We have no interest in pursuing organisms other people can obtain, and that's our major, let's say, filter right now within 
the space we're looking at. The other thing is with there potentially being millions upon millions of species, let alone the compounds within these species that have never been studied, never been cultured, that is virtually an unlimited opportunity within the space we're at. Yeah, John, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I've got two questions, actually. One of them sounds kind of silly to well, me. you'll have I'll, to get back in line. I'll start with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my, my silly questions, well, I, I, I keep a boat up in the uh, western basin of Lake Erie, and, and I, I pay darn good money to have somebody scrape all that algae <laughs> off the bottom of the boat each year. Is that, you, you say you're looking for the things that aren't available, you know, to other people that other people aren't finding. Is the stuff that's growing on everybody's boats and on the shoreline and all the everything up there of, of value? I mean, is that the type of algae that you're using to do your um, It's you know, probably your been studied. Th that's going to be more the macro algae side of it versus the micro. That's a good example of the difference. So I don't need to start saving all that crud I scrape <laughs> off the boat. And, and, and don't send it to us either. I was hoping there was, <laughs> had some sort of futures there, some sort of profit. And, um, and let, me, let me add on to that just for a second, because one of the drug discovery areas that Pharma has jumped on relatively recently and has started to find some very interesting compounds is exactly the kind of algae that grows on organisms, in organisms, and is able to be grabbed. We're in the focal area. We're not just grabbing algae. We're grabbing the bacteria, the funguses, everything that grows in that consortia. And we can really look at what those interactions are. So if it can be grabbed, scraped off a boat, pulled off from the bottom of a lake or floating on a lake and then you can get it with a net, that's not our area of interest. Um, and then secondly, you, you talked about cancer well, research. Come clean your boat. <laughs> <laughs> might find it interesting, a lot of good <laughs> slimy stuff. Um, you mentioned cancer research. Are, does uh, the results that, that, that you're, I don't know, I don't even know how to ask the question. The stuff that you guys are examining, does it show promise in, in helping with other diseases and other medical applications mm -hmm. besides mm -hmm. cancer research? Yeah, and, and a good and example and is lilies. You know, when we first started doing research probably six or seven months ago before I even joined the company, is that I was primarily working through NCI, National mm -hmm. Cancer Institute. Uh, since then, you know, we now are partnering with Lilly, who has, you know, they, they are, a, they pretty much participate in probably 65% of the major disease states. And so that's why we're uh, so interested in partnering with them, because we will start to get the data to prove the utility of our biomass across multiple disease states. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Araya Flynn. I am with the Coalition for Planetary Health and Peace. I'm very excited to be here. Ross knows I have a lot of interest in different things, and plant-based nutrition is one of them. So I'm very excited to see the developments in the algae field, as well as uh, the uh, alternative energy possibilities for it. So um, I guess I wanted to find out about how long do you think, how far away from expanding algae into fuel are we? and uh, the nutritional possibilities for just consumption. Terrific. Uh, it's a great question. One of the things I would say is there's a number of companies that have been well, well funded. Uh, Soul Design in uh, San Francisco area uh, is a company that actually went public at a nearly a billion dollar market cap that's focused on nutraceuticals and focused on cosmetics. They're also looking at biofuel applications. So. There is an investment community out there that is supporting uh, algae to these other products currently. We get tapped and asked by a number of these different companies for the utilization of our technology to support them. And uh, as recently as yesterday, we had a large uh, multinational startup that was focusing on algae specifically for fuels and the kind of products, uh, nutraceuticals and also uh, foods that came to us and said, we want to include you in a new FOA uh, um, or a new answer to a um, government request to study 
algae for these purposes. So it's not going to go away when you talk about the kind of time frame that it'll take. Um, I think that it's, it's everything in time and when there is economic justification for that. It is great to see investments pursuing people that are aggressive and make investments early. Some of them will win big. Some of them will lose big. That's just the reality about biofuel type of investments and some of the other products. Uh, but we will continue to participate in that. We will continue to focus, and I think that's the objective. So you've got an opportunity. You don't ignore it, but you focus, and our focus is to drive biosource of pharmaceuticals to where it can actually contribute and get a return that allows us to do some of these other things we would want to do in another venue at another time. Okay. Thank you. We have time for just one more, so you're it. Made it right under the wire. I'm Mark Butterworth. Ross, just wondering, um, the military has recently announced that they would like to get 10% of their aviation fuel from biofuels. Just wondering if you will, if that will increase the long adoption cycle that you just talked about. Um, it, it will actually uh, shorten it. Um, so when we, when we look at sponsorships, when we look at infrastructure investment into a new strategy, quite frankly, it's going to cost one way or another. Um, those dollars will basically be put to use in advancing the technology further than it could be under a highly competitive environment. And, and it's important, but I think it will shorten the cycle to economic viability. And, and we do, uh, we are faced essentially with the challenges of how much carbon we put in our atmosphere versus how much carbon we take out of our atmosphere. And algae, the reason it's growing in your lakes, the reason it's growing in your swimming pool, or if you just put water out there in a uh, um, dish, you will see algae start to grow there, is the fact that those nutrients and the carbon is in the air to support its recycling of those nutrients. So it's going to happen. It's hard to say when. I'd love to say that it could happen within 10 years, but I think I'm a realist. And that is the opportunity right now is to focus on the highest value because that's where we're going to be able to ultimately create the opportunity to continue down this pathway. You don't want to reach a dead end by doing something that's not economically effective. Thanks, Ross. Thanks for, thanks for some great questions. Yeah. Um, Rich, you have the question. Thank you. Um, uh, for the non-scientists in the group, including myself, I don't think I'll ever look at pond scum or curse the red tide the same way again. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's terrifically interesting, and it's, it's wonderful that you're right here in town doing this stuff. Um, hope you enjoyed the forum today. Uh, you can uh, see it again, as we indicated, on the Ohio channel, or you can uh, find us on YouTube. There's a link to this if you want to take notes from, from the uh, presentation. Uh, there's a link on the CMC website. Uh, we can continue the conversation uh, with uh, our guest at, with coffee and cookies out in the lobby. Uh, we, are, we remain somewhat green ourselves. The name tags, please recycle. There's a basket out there. Drop them in that. If you're interested in any of the Metropolitan Club's uh, forums or what, whatever else we might be doing, put your card in there, and then we'll come solicit you for membership. we got to hit that $1,000 mark. Um, don't forget to register for the uh, new at the zoo, some of which will be here. And uh, let's thank our sponsors once more, Ice Miller and WCBE 90.5 FM. Also, let's thank our speakers, Ross Youngs, Kurt Deek, and our moderator, Dan Moshako. Thank you all for braving the storm, and we'll see you again soon.